Well, you will remember COVID. Who can forget it? I keep calling for a royal commission into the abuse of power during COVID. You'll remember during COVID that this show, pretty much ahead of every other show in Australia, was critical of the vaccine mandates, was critical of mask mandates, was critical of the lockdowns, etc., etc. Rita and I, for our troubles, were defamed in the Australian Senate by the usual suspects simply for attempting to bring you our version of what we thought was actually going on. Someone else who uh, many, many people around the world look to for news on COVID was John Campbell. He has 3 million subscribers on his YouTube channel and over 750 million people have sought out his views on everything on COVID from those original lockdowns through to mandates. He was being a controversial character. Some said that he was uh, calm and measured. That was his approach. Others, of course, have accused him of all sorts of uh, conspiracy theories, etc., etc. Whatever, you judge for yourself. Joining us now in the studio is John Campbell. John, delighted to have you here. Welcome to Australia. Thank you very much. You've arrived at a great time of year, so I hope you're enjoying it. Now, I keep calling for a royal commission into the abuse of power during COVID. Were you to be part of that Royal Commission? Were you to present yourself into a Royal Commission in Australia? What would you be saying? I think I would want to look at what has happened in objective terms and try and compare that to known scientific principles. Because we know quite a lot of the science here. We know a lot of the basic epidemiology. We know a lot from talking to experts around the world, our own Professor Clancy, for example. Absolutely. Who tells us all about the immunology and the way that the viruses interact with the body and how respiratory viruses spread. We need to apply that science to what has happened. And when we do that, retrospectively, we'll see that there's a lot of contradictions, I believe, with the basic science. Now, at the time, this was difficult to assess because we had these authority figures in my country, the chief medical officer, the prime minister, yep. the, the chief <laughs> scientific officer, telling us, well, this is how it is. And because, as a healthcare professional, I follow guidelines all my life, we have to do that in healthcare, otherwise you'd get into trouble probably fairly quickly. It was really hard to go against this authority figures. But because we now believe that the science contradicts what these authority figures told us, I really feel in the United Kingdom it's another end of the age of deference. And I think we're getting that same thing here. So give us some examples. I mean, we've cited many here on this show of where we said X and Y at the time. We were accused of being conspiracy theorists. We were shouted down. We had all sorts of threats against us. Fast forward for a couple of years and it's, it's commonly accepted. Did you have similar experiences to that? We, we did. There's a lot of examples. What lockdowns would do, for example, is postpone the inevitable. You can't stop a respiratory virus. It's going to go everywhere. I've done interviews with people of the calibre of Dr. Claire Craig, for example, and she tells us about the aerosolization of the viruses, that you really can't stop it. So lockdowns can postpone it, can kind of kick it into the long grass for a period of time, but they're never going to stop it. It's inevitable that everyone's going to be exposed to this. Mask wearing is the same. I mean, if someone's actually coughing and spluttering huge amounts of <laughs> liquid, <Whatever>. liquid yeah. <laughs> material <laughs> all, all, all Sunday over, morning, John, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All, all over the yeah. place, then, OK, that, yeah. you know, there's some minimal benefit. But the idea that you can stop these aerosolized, aerosolized viruses getting into the environment is, is just really quite ridiculous. And again, it's comparing the evidence with what actually happened. I think that's the that's the key thing to, to go forward. And again, the prophylactic measures that were taken. The prophylactic measures, um, they can stop you getting very sick in for a short period of time, but they're not really going to stop the spread because they work systemically, whereas the virus is, is aerosolized. Mm. It's, it's in the airways. Yeah. Mm. A lot of contradictions, really. Who yeah. uh, bears the most responsibility? Obviously, we've got the health bureaucrats who, who took a particular line in most countries. But we also had the media, mm. which was complicit. I know BBC's mm. uh, oh, just in the yeah. past week's been accused of just gross scaremongering mm -hmm. to try to back up that mm -hmm. lockdown strategy. So mm -hmm. uh, who do you see as, as the, the people who need to take accountability for yeah. what we saw? Yeah. Strangely enough, some of the politicians are maybe less culpable than you might think because they were advised by senior scientific advisors. And, you know, the politicians will openly admit 
uh, that they're not scientists. But I think politicians should have been much more analytical, much more questioning, yep. much more, what, what is the counter narrative here? OK, you, you've given me this argument, Chief Medical Officer. Let's have some counter argument to this. Let, let's come to some kind of synthesis position. But those, in, those in, in authority, I think, really have got some quite serious questions to answer. And what is concerning is compromise or potential compromise or apparent compromise of our regulatory bodies. TGA, for example, receives a lot of its funding, well over 90%, from industry. TGA uh, is the Australian the, Therapeutics, the Therapeutics and Goods mm-hmm. Administration, yeah. and Britain uh, has a similar and, body. And the same yeah. uh, Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory yeah. Agency. Yeah. Again, I, th- I think it was 86% in the, the last data I had was industry funded. How can these regulatory bodies be giving impartial independent advice? Because we all know the old saying, he who pays the fiddler <laughs> has no say whatsoever in the tune. <laughs> <laughs> James. Well, John, I want to ask you, you know, you said a moment ago, we have to ask why people in authority sort of did all these different things and, you know, went that down this route. The question, though, that I have is... In Australia, for example, we had detailed pandemic plans sitting on the shelf, and I presume in Britain and other countries had the same thing. Tony Abbott, our foreign prime minister, had been health minister and worked on these. And these said, you know, you don't close schools, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do basically everything we did. In April 2020, I wrote about uh, The Lancet, which had done a big study off of SARS and said you don't close schools. Now, finally, four years later, everyone's saying, oh, gosh, this is really screwed with kids' education in all sorts of horrible ways. I'm sure you've seen the same thing. Why is it, do you think, that people in authority ignored all of the work that they'd done in advance to prepare for precisely this eventuality and said, nope, we're going to do this, we're going to make it up as we go along, and we're going to go down the most authoritarian <laughs> path possible. You know, you're absolutely right. I've been teaching my students for 20, 30 years now. Another pandemic is going to be coming. OK, we thought it might be influenza. It turns out to be coronavirus. But we knew another pandemic was coming. That was inevitable. And as you rightly say, governments had detailed plans of how this would be done. We learned, as you say, from the SARS coronavirus uh, 1 epidemic, mm-hmm. 2000 and 2003. A lot was learned from that and, and other epidemics over the years. The plans were there in detail. But when it actually happened, they, like, to a large extent, they seem to be basically ignored. And... Scientists, medical advisors, governments around the world seem to go into some kind of panic mode, really. So why they ignored the the detailed planning, and I think ignored is a reasonable word to use there. I think that's a really good question for these guys. You know, we had these contingencies worked out by experts over decades. Why were these ignored? Was it panic? And questions should be asked. Was it vested interest? Well, well, weren't they just following the World Health Authority who was following uh, China? World Health, Health Organization said lockdowns are working in China, so everyone else. How important is Sweden in, in that uh, yeah, equation? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're really yeah, one of the absolutely. few places that went against this. Yeah. Uh, and states like Florida and Texas as well. So yeah. what have we learned from their mm-hmm. approach compared to what we yeah. did here in Australia, yeah. UK, yeah. US? It's interesting. In psychiatry, there's a concept called folie a deux, follow after mm-hmm. you, where, where, where someone adopts abnormal psychiatric <laughs> behaviour. <laughs> and, and that's what seems to have happened on the international stage. <laughs> you know, Indeed. Did, did, did the Australia lock down because the UK locked down? Or were we looking at you guys and thought, oh, they've done it, we better do it? Yeah. And every country seemed to go the, the same way, except, except Sweden, as you say, a notable example. They gave recommendations to their citizens. They didn't use it as an opportunity to seize power. They they said, look, this is what we recommend. And strangely enough, most people were quite sensible and did what was recommended. (laughs) They they actually followed the guidelines really, really quite well. So what, uh, what is the lesson, I guess, Next time, you know, we keep being told, oh, another pandemic is going to come around. But what will happen next time? Has government bodies and governments and institutions, have they been tarnished by this? I mean, the fact that your YouTube, 750 million views, as I say, uh, you've been teaching on YouTube about various uh, medical things for many, many years. But was there a hunger for people to, and this is certainly our experience on this show, there was mm. a hunger to get information that maybe ran against mm. the narrative mm. because people in a democracy are supposed to be able to make up their own minds about these things. So what's going to happen next time? Do you think the authorities will clamp down harder? The World Health Organization keeps saying, oh, there's going to be disease X or whatever. 
But what does happen? Or are people going to be so burnt and bruised by the COVID experience that they're going to say, no, this ain't happening again? Mm. And, and that could equally be counterproductive with people ignoring any legitimate advice, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. what do you I, think? I, I agree with those points. It's really quite sad that so many people tune into me because, you know, there's kind of a need for that. Pe people want that reassurance. You know, th th this information should be coming from the authorities people that we can trust. And there's no question in my mind, there's a massive loss of trust. Mm. I, I feel this talking to people I know, even talking to people here, but certainly comments from around the world, there's a great lack of trust. So who do we look to? Because there is going to be another pandemic. Now, where that pandemic comes from is an interesting question. If people are still doing various <laughs> yes. types of virological research in various <laughs> laboratories around yes. the world, funded by various people around the world, <laughs> uh, in laboratories that are somewhat leaky, yeah. uh, then uh, I'm afraid another pandemic is uh, inevitable. Whether it's a natural zoonotic one or whether it's a, a human-assisted uh, one, shall, shall we say. So this is going to happen. This is inevitable. And when it does happen, it's possible that there's a new virus which is much more lethal. It really is possible that we could have a virus which, you know, kills 50% or more of people that are, are affected, you know, Ebola. And we, we have these viruses that are there. If they became more transmissible, it is a big concern. Who do we look to? Well, do we look to the World Health Organization? Well, again, that's been greatly compromised. We know there's personal vested interest in that. We know that there's political apparent. And political they're trying to seize more power with this oh, global pandemic treaty. What do you make of that? Ma massive. I've been talking to James Roguski in the States about this, who's been following it through, and various other people. And power grab is the term that I would personally use. Yep. They are trying to assume power. They're trying to centralize power. The whole point about a pandemic is you need a localised response. Mm. Local doctors know what's best for their people. Local administrators hopefully would know what's best for their people. And the idea that the World Health Organization can impose a one size fits all, to me, just seems quite ludicrous. And potentially impose treatments that could have, as I read these things, the authority of the nation state to enforce it. Yeah. So exactly. we, we do have the risk of internationalized uh, totalitarian response. And if a new pandemic happened now, with the flow of information that we will get, it would be very difficult for people like me to adjudicate exactly how serious the risk is. Because if the World Health Organization says there's a serious risk and this works and that doesn't, then based on previous um, evidence, I think we'd have to interrogate that quite clearly before we applied it to ourselves and our loved ones. John Campbell, you've got millions of people watching you around the world. So great to, great to have you here on Outsiders pleasure, this morning. Enjoy Australia. Great to chat to you and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Great. Coming up, a lot more. We've got Robert Milner who's going to talk about nature.